The following program is paid for by the friends and ministry partners of the Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, welcome, welcome, church family. You are loved. You were uniquely and wonderfully made, and you have something to offer this world that no one, no one else can. Thank you for being here this morning. Would you turn around to the person next to you and say, God loves you, and so do I. Can we give a big thank you to the Sons of the American Revolution for being with us every year? And if we have any veterans in the house, would you just raise your hand? We just want to say thank you uh, for all you do. First responders as well, please raise your hand. Thank you. Appreciate you. It's going to be a great day today. You're going to leave here with hope and joy. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for all that you do in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, many of us are coming here with heavy things on our hearts and minds, and we thank you, God, that you can give us freedom, power, joy, life. And I pray in Jesus' name, every chain would be broken. I thank you, Lord, that even through the struggles that we go through in life, you bring us to greater freedom and greater power. So we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
may be seated. In preparation for Bobby's message, the words of our Lord from 2 Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Church family, we serve a God who heals. Amen.
Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, Lord of all nations, we pause to reflect upon our blessings as a nation and the high cost of those blessings. We offer our prayers of thanks and intercession. Thank you for the freedom we enjoy in this country, for opportunities to flourish, and for the security of our land. Thank you for those who have served in the armed services of our country, risking their lives for our liberty. Thank you for those who have given their lives in service to our country, sacrificing in such a costly way for the sake of others, including all of us here today. Thank you for those who have given their lives so that those who live in other countries might experience freedom from tyranny and oppression. Oh Lord, may we be more aware of just how blessed we are as a nation. May we be more grateful for our blessings, more faithful in stewarding them well, more eager to share them with others even as we remember those who have given their lives in the past, we also think of those whose lives are on the line today. Protect them. Encourage them. Bring them home safely and soon. Give wisdom to the leaders of our armed services that they might know how to best deploy the troops in the cause of freedom. May their efforts be successful so that peace with justice might be established in our world. Guide those who lead our nation in international affairs. Help them to pursue diplomatic paths that prevent needless conflict. May they have your wisdom about when and how to use the military you have entrusted to us. God of peace, stir in the hearts of the leaders of all nations and in all who would use violence to further their cause. Change their hearts and minds. Give them a passion for peace. Bring an end to pain, an end to suffering, an end to injustice, and an end to violence in our world. We know, Lord, that ultimate peace will not come until your kingdom is here in all of its fullness. Nevertheless, we pray for a foretaste of the future. We ask for the growth of peace throughout our world today so that fewer and fewer men and women will have to risk and even to sacrifice their lives. We long for the day when people will, in the words of the prophet Isaiah, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. May your kingdom come, Lord, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All praise be to you, God of grace, God of mercy, God of justice, God of peace, King of kings and Lord of lords, the great I am. Amen. Amen. We're in a spirit of reflection. And that's very much what uh, an offering time is about, reflecting upon God's faithfulness in the past. God's faithfulness not only to us in the past, but to our forefathers as well. And based on that faithfulness, we look towards the future with great expectation of knowing that the Lord is with us, that the Lord will continue to guide us. So this morning, as we prepare to receive this morning's offering, we do so in a spirit of remembering our great God, remembering what God has done in the past, and with great expectation, knowing what God will do in the future. So this morning, I'd like to invite the ushers forward as we prepare to receive this morning's offering. Friends, you are loved and deeply valued by the God who made you. And this is a message you're helping the Hour of Power share with a world in need. Every week, Hour of Power brings a program of hope and encouragement to millions of people. And your love, prayers, and generosity keep this ministry going. As we move forward into the summer season, we're excited to announce that we have a group of friends who've donated $250,000 to a Love and Dignity Matching Challenge. 
This challenge will match your donation dollar for dollar in support of this life-changing ministry. We have three important efforts that meeting the $250,000 goal will help us fund. Number one, it will help us just keep the ministry of the Hour of Power coming to you and to your family. Number two, it'll help us expand the Hour of Power broadcast to allow millions around the world to hear the truth of God's love, grace, and dignity. And number three, it'll help us create pastoral care as a part of Hour of Power. Many people consider this broadcast their church, so we want to make this a reality. Some of you maybe have never given to this ministry. I really want to encourage you to step out in faith and give your gift during this challenge. This fund will match every single dollar you give, which means your gift will be doubled and go twice as far to share the life-affirming truth of God's love with people in need. Friends, God is present and at work in your life and in the life of others through your prayers and partnership with the Hour of Power. Thank you, and God bless you. To request your copy of the book, I Am, Knowing God by Name, as well as a DVD or CD of Bobby's I Am Message series, please call, write, or go online today. Based on Bobby's Message series, this coffee table book will remind you of all the ways God promises to be Yahweh through you. Each chapter is filled with inspirational illustrations and scripture references designed to help you in your daily walk with God. Your generous gift of $75 or more will include the book and a three-disc DVD set or the book and a four-disc CD set. This is the final week for the Love and Dignity Matching Challenge, so call, write, or go online today. Thank you for watching The Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. Now, let's return to the service. Lord, we remember you and your great faithfulness, your faithfulness to us, your faithfulness to our forefathers, and your faithfulness to the generation that is to come. Lord, we worship you this morning. We give you all the praise. We pray that these, our tithes and our offerings, be used in your kingdom to promote your peace and your hope and your banner of love to the whole world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you for joining us on television and online. We're so glad that you're joining us today. You are a part of Shepherd's Grove. We want you to know that no matter where you are, we believe in you and we think you're a part of this church. Right, church? Yes. That's all right. That's an affirmative. So let's say this together. Would you hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving and say this with me? I am not what I do. I'm not what I have. I am not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. God heals. God heals. He heals everything. Everywhere he goes, all he does is heal. He brings goodness. He brings life. God does not condemn you today. He speaks healing, life, encouragement, goodness over you. Receive it by faith. Many of us are coming to church today sick, uh, a little sick or a lot sick, or burdened, or maybe you're bringing today your broken relationships, your broken family, your broken heart, a broken mind. I want you to know God heals. He heals everything. He heals everything, and he's going to heal you. I want you to believe that today, and if you believe anything, believe that. It's easy to get discouraged when we say that God heals. So many Rotten things can happen in life. It's easy to lose your faith and to think, well, where is God? Or is there a God? Or why has he forgotten us? And I want you to never stop believing, friends, that God heals, God does miracles, and I mean legit miracles, that he can heal your body. He can heal what doctors say can't be healed. He's a great physician. And his very name, Jehovah Rapha, means I am your healer. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Maybe you're bringing today some woundedness and brokenness and sickness God can heal it. In fact, if you get close enough to God, he will heal it. That's all he does is heal. He does a lot more than that, but he heals, and that's, that's who he is. I know today, um, Hannah and I got some terrible news yesterday. A friend of our family, a young girl in her 20s, uh, passed away yesterday. And she's actually attended this church before. And so, like, it's really hard in a time like that to say, well, like, where is God in that, you know? Or on the other tragedies that maybe you're facing, when we talk about a God who heals and a God who does good and then something so, so horrible happens, how do we reconcile that with the true belief that God really does heal people? And the answer is simply that it's, it's this, hear this. There is no tragedy, no tragedy God cannot redeem. He redeems death. He redeems sickness. He redeems all of the things that you're facing in your life. I truly believe the only reason God doesn't give people the miracle they ask for is because he has a better one in store. And I know our friend who died yesterday received her miracle. That can seem hopeless because it's like, well, I don't want to die and receive my miracle of dying and going to heaven, right? And, but, but when you get there, you'll see it truly is. It's more like waking up than falling asleep. And we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry. But when we say things like that, never let that negate from the very true fact that God can heal your body today. Today. That's what Jesus did. That's what he's still doing. I've seen it lots of times, and I believe it. And I believe it for you, if you'll receive it. God heals. His name is Jehovah Rapha. He heals bodies. He heals minds. He heals relationships. He heals countries. And the only reason that something is not healed is that it's either not God's time or it's not close enough to heaven. Jesus brings his whole life into your life and can bring healing. Actually, it was interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine. Now, I don't know if this is a true Orthodox view, but he was a Eastern Orthodox, like Greek Orthodox, and studying for seminary. And he said, we believe... As Orthodox Christians, our definition of salvation is it's kind of like the whole world had a sickness and God injected his son, Jesus Christ, as you would inject through a needle. Uh, he injected Jesus as a cure into the world. Isn't that an interesting image? 
that as Jesus came into the world, he brought with him heaven. And the closer people came to Jesus, the closer they came to health, life, goodness. Anyone who follows him receives eternal life. One of the coolest ways to understand this is in the Old Testament understanding of the temple. Today we read a scripture from 2 Chronicles, which is an important part. It goes like this. That God chose a people, and we've been talking about this, to usher in heaven back into the world. When you read the Bible, you actually see, we as Americans say heaven and hell a lot. Heaven and hell, heaven and hell. They're always paired. But the Bible usually pairs heaven with earth. So you say heaven and earth. And then hell is usually mentioned separately over here. So you've got heaven and earth always together. Heaven and earth. All of heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. And then over here you've got hell. Hell is a real place. It's a, it's a thing in the Bible. But the reason heaven and earth are together is because God wants to bring heaven and earth back together. And the way he began doing that was through the temple. Everyone say the temple. <laughs> this is so important to understand Judaism. And in fact to understand the Holy Spirit. You have to understand the temple. So God chose a family, Abraham, and through this family, he made covenant with them that they'd be blessed and they'd be a blessing to the whole world. And this family, who grew into a great nation, was brought into captivity in Egypt. And as God brought them out of Egypt into the promised land, they carried with them this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you know what the Ark of the Covenant looks like because you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> it is that golden death box that opens up and kills all the Nazis. And Indiana and his girlfriend are tied to the pole. They keep their eyes closed. Right? You know what it looks like. And by the way, it looks just like that. And it's a big golden box with wings. And in that box are the stones of the Ten Commandments. And this golden box, it represents the throne of God. Everywhere this box is, the real, actual presence of God is. And so to handle this box, they build a tent-like temple around it called a tabernacle. And the tabernacle is meant to create the, the certain necessary rights and protections to actually protect people from that throne. Because if you touch it, you die. Even if you're a good person, there's a really good guy and it's falling over and he tries to keep it from falling over and when he touches it, he dies. Because it's like electricity, you know, it's just charged with power. Anyway, so there's this tabernacle. And the dream is, what, as the tabernacle is in Shiloh, that they will actually be brought to Jerusalem and it will be made into a temple. Well, David, King David, in Chronicles, wants to do this. He dreams of it. He gets everything in order, all of the timber and the stone and the musicians and everything that the Lord says will be needed to, to build this temple to house the real, actual throne and presence of God. But through Nathan, God tells David... You can't build this temple because there's blood on your hands. Now, we don't know how to parse that. David was a general, lots of wars. He was, in fact, a murderer, a forgiven murderer, but still killed a guy. And for whatever reason, God said, you're not going to build this temple, your son will. Years later, Solomon goes through the biggest, most important building project of his life. Builds this immense Amazing temple, places the Ark of the Covenant on the inside, lays out uh, a sacrifice of 20,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. Some of that will probably be eaten later in a big feast, but, so it doesn't totally go to waste, but man, that is a lot of filet mignon and mutton. <laughs> and he brings these animals into the finish, right? And he sets everything up, and, and everything is about ready to go, and then heaven opens up, and the, the center of the temple is filled with fire, smoke, and a great cloud of God's presence. I mean, just picture, whoosh, just this huge thing of power. And nobody can go inside. They're all kind of afraid. And the priests all fall down in unison on their knees. And they shout in song, his love endures forever. And the altar was lit aflame where the lamps were, and those lanterns stayed lit for 400 years until the Babylonians destroyed that place. And that temple then became the priestly center of Judaism, the first temple ever built, and that's where Jews could go before the throne of God, as you would before a king. And it was in that place you would find healing, forgiveness, healing, forgiveness, 
in that place, heaven was there, right there, right in the middle. Because everywhere God is, heaven is. And heaven has all you need. And so this is the beginning of heaven on earth, in the temple, right there, right in the middle. Isn't that cool? That night, Solomon, they've been partying all day, right? I mean, they had a huge celebration. They ate a lot of that steak and a lot of that mutton, and they had wine and celebrating, and this great thing that God had done to begin the reconciling of all mankind through Abraham's family is now taking, you know, really symbolically taking root in this temple. And so that night, he's had a great day, and King Solomon lays down to bed, and the Lord visits him in the quiet of the night. And he says, some of my people will turn their back on me. Some of them will sin and fall away. Some of them will be broken. Some of them will lose their farms. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. What a promise, huh? What a promise. I often think that healing and forgiveness go together very, very well. Very often, the stuff that we're, well, actually, all of the stuff that we face in life is the result either of our sin or someone else's sin, the fallenness of the world from heaven. It's separateness from God. And, and vice versa, a lot of times, a lot of the sin we do is coming from a place of hurt and brokenness, not always a place of choice. Let me put this down, that some of us, some of us are praying for forgiveness when we need to pray for healing. And some of us are praying for healing when we need to pray for forgiveness. Maybe you come to church today and you're addicted you're addicted to substance. Maybe you're sexually addicted to stuff. Maybe you're addicted to spending. You're addicted to work. You're withdrawing in, into whatever it is, and you just you you feel guilty about it, and you feel a lot of shame, and you just keep asking God, "Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me." But the Lord might be saying to you today that maybe more than forgiveness, what you really need is healing. Healing. Maybe at the core of some of these decisions is a brokenness, a hurt, a loneliness, an emptiness, a meaninglessness that hasn't been addressed that leaves you powerless in your ability to make good decisions. Some of us come today and we're saying, God, heal my family or heal my body or heal this or heal that, but we have all these choices that we've been making. You know, maybe you want to reconcile with your kids or with your brother or with a colleague, but you haven't taken responsibility for your side. Yeah, they did a lot of bad stuff, but you haven't asked for forgiveness. You're asking God to heal, but you're not able to heal with them because in their eyes you haven't reconciled or taken responsibility for your choices. And so in that case, forgiveness has to happen before you're healing. In all cases, when God heals and when God forgives, he doesn't do just a little part. He does everything. When God heals, he doesn't just heal your body. He heals your soul. He heals your spirit. He heals your heart. He heals your family. And he heals your country. God is a healer. Everywhere he goes, he brings healing with him. And maybe you're here today and you think, you don't, Bobby, you don't know what the doctors just told me. Or Bobby, you don't know what my family has gone through. Bobby, you don't know what kind of loss I've faced or the way that I was hurt when I was a child or the way I was hurt when I was in college. Uh, this hasn't been healed for 50, for 20, for 100, whatever years, and I just don't feel like I'm ever going to be healed. God heals. It's all he does, and he wants to heal you today. He wants to heal you. God's delivery system is faith. Faith is the thing that connects your heart, your mind, and your body to heaven. I'm a preacher, so I got off track. I'm sorry. <laughs> We were talking about the temple, weren't we? <laughs> 400 years goes by after King Solomon, and this temple, the flame burns within, and people can come to the Holy of Holies and to atone for their sins and to receive uh, healing and life and everything that makes them a people and makes them in covenant with God. And after 400 years, they're conquered by the Babylonians, and the temple is destroyed. 70 years goes by, 
The Jewish people then are able to rebuild the temple with Ezra and Nehemiah, and this is the second temple. Everyone say second temple. temple. And this is an important thing because it's the reclaiming after the Babylonian exile. Cyrus comes in, he frees, he's the Persian who conquers Babylon, and he frees the Jewish people to go home, and they then give the second temple a facelift. Everybody say facelift. This is California. (laughs) We know what that is. We know what a facelift is. A lot of sun here. A lot of wrinkles, because we enjoy the sun. <laughs> Temple got a facelift from a guy named Herod. Everybody say Herod. Herod. I'm going to die. This is dumb. This is not youth group. We're going to stop doing this. A guy named Herod comes in. He makes the temple awesome. Oh, my gosh. The temple looks amazing. I mean, it, it is, at that time, one of the largest, most spectacular buildings in the world, and it is the center of Jewish life, the Holy Spirit dwells in the center of the Holy of Holies, and it is the throne of God. And only some people, particular priests, at certain times are allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, and the only way you get close to God is through animals and through this priest and through ceremony, and and that's how you're able to get to the very dangerous but very good uh, power and life of God. And so there's a whole culture and religion built around this, and this is ancient first century Judaism. And it's into that world that Jesus comes. And everything that people want from the temple as Jews, they start getting from Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is God. And so that same peace of God that is in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy of Holies, is now in Jesus, so that as people who have gone to the temple, have gotten miracles and gotten things from God, when they get close to Jesus, it's like, Jesus is like the temple on steroids. It's like times a million. Like, they, you know, and everywhere, everywhere Jesus goes, I mean, everything changes for the better everywhere he goes. And everywhere he goes, he heals. He heals everybody. Everywhere he goes, he's bringing heaven with him. He's raising people from the dead. He's healing people of leprosy. He's freeing people from demonic oppression. He's speaking truth to power. He's breaking all of these chains in society and religious bondage. And everywhere he's going, people are just getting freed left and right. He's God. And then, like one of the coolest things about Jesus, you know, Jesus even... He's, so, he's such a healing presence. He's on his way to heal Jairus' daughter. On his way, while he's on his way to raise someone from the dead, someone else who has a bleeding disease, she can't, she's had this disease for 10 years. She thinks, if I can just touch him, I'll be healed. She just barely touches the hem of his garment, and she's healed. Jesus is such a healer, he heals people on accident. You don't think it was an accident? Of course it was. He turns around and he goes, who, t- who touched me? Right? And, they go, and then, of course, his disciples are like, oh, Jesus, everybody's touching you. He's like, no, 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 no. Someone touched me with faith, and I felt power go out of me into her. Huh? So Jesus is healing. Jesus is heaven. And to touch Jesus is to touch heaven. To be with him is to be in heaven, alive today. This same Jesus goes into the second temple. We already said it, say second temple. (laughs) And he says, destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. This famous line, by the way, is the main thing that his enemies used to have him crucified. They said he was inciting a rebellion. But we know what that meant. When Christ was crucified, that same place, the Holy of Holies, that was the throne of God, that had all this power in it, this like Raiders of the Lost Ark, Nazi killing, body healing power, right? It's in this little room. When Jesus dies on the cross, that this veil that covers that holy place is ripped in two, huh? Because when Christ dies, that spirit then leaves. Well, where does it go? We know. On Pentecost, every believer, not just Pentecostals, okay? I'm charismatic, so I get to say that. But not every believer in that room received power from the Spirit. 
that same spirit that was in the Holy of Holies, it's in you right now. Lots of Christians and Jews talk about the third temple that will be built on Mount Moriah where the, right now the Dome of the Rock is. Lots of people talk about it'll happen. Maybe it'll happen. That would be cool. I don't know. The third temple's already been built and is being built. It's you. And it's me. You're the third temple. You're the temple. You're the temple. You see, when Jesus came into the world, he didn't just want to come into the world to save it. He, he wanted to make you like him. Do not miss this. You became... In your baptism, a part and totally the third temple that will never be destroyed. Your heart became the holy of holies. God sits upon the throne of your heart right now. And everywhere you go, you can be like Jesus, where people just being near you are healed, touched, blessed by you. That people will touch the hem of your garment and get healed accidentally. You have so much incredible power and life in you, and many of you don't even know it. And part of what God wants to reveal to you today is that healing is yours, and it is those who come to you by faith. You say, Bobby, I don't have anything inside of me. I don't have any, any fire or anything like that. I always think it's like this that when you're baptized, you get fire put inside of you. And the lowest it can go is a pilot light. You know, pilot, little blue flame. You don't even see it unless you get close, but it's there and you need it. And the way you turn that flame up is through faith, and faith is the gas. Man, some of you old-timer Christians here, you've got so much fire in life. You've known the Lord for a long time. You are just a source of healing and life and goodness. But sometimes in our lives, as we've gone through hurt and anguish and sickness and doubt and dark night of the soul, that gas gets turned down and we think, well, gosh, there's nothing left of that. I think the Lord wants to say to you today, turn the gas up. Uh, turn up that flame. Uh, you have a, not only a, a, a right, but a responsibility to be Rafa to be healing. There is this power within you, released by faith, that allows you and others uh, to be healed. So you come today, and maybe somebody told you that God doesn't heal bodies anymore. Yeah, he heals hearts and he heals minds. That is baloney. I know it's baloney. God did not take away miracle-working power with the disciples. That's dumb. You know why that's dumb? I have seen so many miracles, and it doesn't even say that in the Bible. It's modernism that rejects, you know, it's like everything has to be scientific. God does miracles all the time. And though we don't always get it the way we want it and when we want it, do not lose your faith in believing God can give you your miracle today. I remember when I was in Thailand, one of the first early miracles I ever saw a lady with a cancerous tumor on her neck. I was with people of faith, and they laid hands on her, and when they were done praying, they pulled their hand off, and a tumor was gone. See, it's, we're a scientific world, so now you are given a choice. You have to choose to believe me. Either this guy is crazy, or he's lying, or he really saw this. Not only did I see that, I saw we prayed for rain on the same, it was actually in the same prayer. It hadn't rained, they were in a drought. And we prayed for rain, and the end of the day it started raining, and the locals started worshiping us as gods. We said, no, no! <laughs> um, you guys know many of these stories. I was hit, we saw the, a, a leader of our, of our troop, a young girl, who was, she was young, seemed so old at the time, 28. <laughs> so, she's young. She was hit by a car, flung through the air, wasn't hurt. Her pants weren't even dirty. That was the coolest part. She was wearing white, white pants. <laughs> and we saw, um, gosh, I, in fact, I remember when, and I've told you the story, when I, I had, uh, I was going deaf in my ear for months, chronic, I was losing my ear, ear, I was losing my hearing, 
And uh, I went to bed depressed early, and Hannah's mom, who I think was the only, one of the few people that knew, just stayed up all night fasting and praying that I would be healed, and I was. Now, there are lots of times we pray and we don't get what we ask for. Don't. Don't stop praying. God does miracles. Easter did happen. God will reconcile all things. Heaven is here. Heaven is in you right now. There's so much power, and it is released through faith. Believe you are living stones in a holy temple. Believe you are the temple of God. Believe that your heart is the throne of God. And believe everywhere he is, heaven and healing is. And believe in your miracle. Yeah, everything's changing, and change is hard, but there is not one tragedy God will not redeem if you respond with faith. Faith to believe that he is not God the judge. He is God the healer. He's not God the abandoner. He's God the healer. He wants you to hear this voice today. My beloved child, I haven't left you. Release your faith and believe in healing. Healing for your body. Healing for your broken heart. Healing for your wounded soul. Healing for your broken family. Forgiveness of your sins. And healing for your country. Do we need healing for our country? You bet we do. Need healing in your family? You bet we do. And God can do it. You need healing in your body? Well, Robert said everybody's a little bit sick. You bet we do. I guarantee you, half the people in this room brought something in their body today. And it's easy to think God doesn't care about your arthritis or he doesn't care about your small health problem that's bothering you. He does. And you can believe in faith today that he will heal you. Don't give up that miracle. Don't give it up. Doctors don't give you the last word. The Bible does. And it is good. And don't think that just because you're wounded or just because you're sick or just because you're broken or you're divorced or your family is broken or you have some sin in your life that you too can't be a healer. You didn't choose God. He chose you. And sometimes it's through the process of being a healing presence to others that we receive our healing. It's sometimes in forgiving others that we receive our forgiveness. Henry Nouwen called this the wounded healer. The best doctors in the world are the ones who have been sick themselves because they know the pain and the suffering of being stuck in a hospital, of being sick, of not being able to get out and do things. And so they not only provide the healing, they know what their clients need. The best counselors and the best pastors are the ones who, who have had to work through their own issues. I believe that the more wounded you are and the more wounded you've been, the more capable you are of being a healer. Don't view your wounds or your sin as something that's keeping you back from doing God's will. See the pain of those experiences as the very crucible that prepared you for this moment. God has forgiven your sin. He's going to get you out of whatever your addiction is, whatever your brokenness, or whatever your woundedness is. He's going to heal you and he's going to do it for greater purpose that you can be a wounded healer to others, that you can be the temple, that you can be the place that people can come to and draw close to the real presence of God and perhaps touch the hem of your garment and receive the healing they've been praying for for years. Believe it in faith, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for being here. You're going to have an awesome week. You're going to be blessed this week. You're going to make the right choices. You're going to go down the path of life and not the path of death. God's going to bless every step you take. He's going to open doors no man could shut. He's going to shut doors no man could open. It's going to be a good week. If you believe it, say amen. amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, you are loved and deeply valued by the God who made you. And this is a message you're helping the Hour of Power share with a world in need. Every week, Hour of Power brings a program of hope and encouragement to millions of people, and your love, prayers, and generosity keep this ministry going. As we move forward into the summer season, we're excited to announce that we have a group of friends who've donated $250,000 to a Love and Dignity Matching Challenge. This challenge will match your donation dollar for dollar in support of this life-changing ministry. We have three important efforts that meeting the $250,000 goal will help us fund. Number one, it will help us just keep the ministry of the Hour of Power coming to you and to your family. Number two, it'll help us expand the Hour of Power broadcast to allow millions around the world to hear the truth of God's love, grace, and dignity. And number three, it'll help us create pastoral care as a part of Hour of Power. Many people consider this broadcast their church, so we want to make this a reality. Some of you maybe have never given to this ministry. I really want to encourage you to step out in faith and give your gift during this challenge. This fund will match every single dollar you give, which means your gift will be doubled and go twice as far to share the life-affirming truth of God's love with people in need. Friends, God is present and at work in your life and in the life of others through your prayers and partnership with the Hour of Power. Thank you, and God bless you. To request your copy of the book, I Am, Knowing God by Name, as well as a DVD or CD of Bobby's I Am Message series, please call, write, or go online today. Based on Bobby's message series, this coffee table book will remind you of all the ways God promises to be Yahweh through you. Each chapter is filled with inspirational illustrations and scripture references designed to help you in your daily walk with God. Your generous gift of $75 or more will include the book and a three-disc DVD set or the book and a four-disc CD set. This is the final week for the Love and Dignity Matching Challenge. So call, write, or go online today. Thank you for watching The Hour of Power and for your ongoing generous support to help keep this program on the air. The preceding program was paid for by the friends and ministry partners of the Hour of Power and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.